Welcome to the Backyard Professor Podcast Series. I'm recording live in my little log cabin from the Rocky Mountains here in lovely Idaho. I'm Kerry Schertz, the Backyard Professor. Quantum mechanics, or quantum physics. The words are enough to send chills up and down your spine. So many people, when they hear these words, they say, Oh, no, 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 not that. Too deep for me. No, I'm too stupid to understand this. But quantum physics, quantum mechanics, is really quite simple. It's very easy. It's about the little. It's about atoms. The so-called stuff that stuff is made of. Atoms and how they interact with each other. And you think, well, that's chemistry. Well, yes, it is. It is chemistry. But it's also quantum physics. How do the electrons combine and let go? What makes an atom of iron different from an atom of carbon or cesium or hydrogen or helium? This is what quantum mechanics is all about. The workings of the very tiny things, so-called, that we know as atoms. With quantum, it has been discovered that atoms are both particles and waves. And that brings up an inherent contradiction. In fact, some, some physicists have called these wavicles instead of a particle or a wave. When you think about this, a particle, say you take a, a watermelon, one of my very favorite summertime foods after dinner, of course, everybody loves a watermelon, and you put the watermelon over there, ten feet away from you. If it represented a particle, a thing, it would be over there, ten feet away from you, not right here in my lap while I eat it. It's over there, not here. A particle is localized, in other words. But a wave, when you look at the beautiful ocean, one of the most stunning parts of creation on this world, you see ocean waves that stretch far beyond even your eyesight. They go for miles and miles and miles. Surfers love the big waves, yes. Waves are spread out over space. They can almost seem to be everywhere. So how can a particle, say Einstein said the photon, the Greek word for light, was a particle. Whereas a hundred years before him, and through very many different types of experiments, light was absolutely proven to be a wave. How can it be both? How can it be both localized and spread out over space? This is one of the enigmas, the most interesting puzzles to the idea that nature is trying to tell us something which quantum physics and quantum mechanics deal with. Isaac Asimov, in his delightful study, Understanding Physics, I have the edition that put all three of his volumes together, I believe this one's... uh, Let me look it up real quick. This is 1966. This is the Dorset Press. It was a 1988 reprint. Actually, they just put the thing together. Under his chapter of Quanta, on page 135, under photons, well, Einstein showed the energy quanta to its logical conclusion. A quantum seemed to be analogous to an atom of energy, or a particle of energy, So why not consider such particles to be particles? Light, then, would consist of particles, which were eventually called photons. This notion came as a shock, because, like I said, light had been considered and proven to be a wave. Well, what was to be done with all the interference experiments and the polarization experiments showing light was a wave? Nothing at all. You don't have to do anything to them. It's just wrong to think that an object must be either a particle or a wave. You might just as well imagine that either we are head down and an Australian head up, or we are head up and an Australian head down. A photon is both a particle and a wave, depending on the point of view. 
all the fundamental units of the universe are both particles and waves at the same time. Now this is a remarkable state of affairs. <laughs> when you think of an electron as a wave, now the quantum physicist has demonstrated that electrons, before they're viewed, have both properties, particle and a wave, but you don't know which it is or where it is. And thus quantum physics, in the Copenhagen interpretation of Niels Bohr, basically declared that they were therefore literally everywhere and yet nowhere all at once. They didn't even exist until they were observed. But they were continuous everywhere. Now when we when we analyze this and think it through, our section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants, this was the revelation given to Joseph Smith at Kirtland, Ohio, December 27, 1832. Now, if Joseph Smith had given us nothing else except this, I mean, even if he had never given us the Book of Mormon, if, if we didn't have the Book of Abraham, if we didn't have the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible, or any of the other revelations in our Doctrine and Covenants, section 88 establishes Joseph Smith as having revelation from an outside source bona fide strongly more than anything I have ever read. I sometimes have trouble figuring out which is harder, understanding the implications of Section 88 or understanding the LDS refusal to understand the implications of Section 88. I've had well-known LDS scholars argue with me vehemently that how I understand Section 88 is not the way it's supposed to be because it smacks of mysticism. Well, I think Section 88 is probably one of the strongest mystical sections in all of existence that Joseph Smith received as a revelation, talking about the glory of the Church of the Firstborn, about the Savior, the, the Comforter who was promised to come, he will come, section 4 and 5, or uh, verses 4 and 5, and you would have eternal life, even the glory of the celestial kingdom, which glory is that of the church of the firstborn. I'm in verse 5 right now. Even of God, the holiest of all, through Jesus Christ his Son. Verse 6, He that ascended up on high, now this is talking about Jesus, as also he descended below all things, in that he comprehended all things, that he might be in all and through all things, the light of truth, which truth shineth. Very interesting here. This is the light of Christ. This truth shineth. It is in and through all things, according to verse 6. He is in the light of the sun, and the power thereof by which it was made, as also in the moon, and the light of the moon, and the power by which it was made, as also the light of of the stars, in verse 9, and the power which they were made, and the earth also, and the power thereof, even the earth upon which you stand. 11. And the light which shineth, which giveth you light, is through him who enlighteneth your eyes, which is the same light that quickeneth your understandings. Verse 12 begins to rock you. Which light proceedeth forth from the presence of God to fill the immensity of space, the light which is in all things, which giveth life to all things, which is the law by which all things are governed, even the power of God, who sitteth upon his throne, who is in the bosom of eternity, who is in the midst of all things.' 